Great. Okay, so uh, my plan was, is this the last presentation before lunch or... Yes, uh, we... there's one more. There is one more. Okay, then I don't have to jump around and try to, to get your attention. So, yeah, I will try to, to, to go through this presentation and then keep it a little bit interesting and hopefully get the same reaction as the previous one with, with some comments and questions. So, I will talk about the Infodemic Management Laboratory and the Momentum Project that, that I'm coordinating for the region. Uh, tell you a little bit about the END in Serbia, and you have heard me joke about Eastern Europe, so maybe you'll hear some more jokes about that. Uh, some of our methods, uh, how we developed a social behavior change strategy, uh, something about addressing the, the infodemic and how we implemented the strategy, and maybe some conclusions and uh, uh, way forward. Uh, I would really like to thank the organizers for, for inviting me here and it's been really a great experience hearing about all of your experiences and I hope to, to implement this in, in my work. So here's a bit about the Laboratory for Infodemiology and Infodemic Management. Uh, we have at my department at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Belgrade, uh, two trained infodemic managers uh, and we have really worked together uh, with the support of, of um, WHO headquarters, uh, but also of our department, uh, WHO Europe and the country office and a lot of colleagues and friends and family. To, to work uh, and, and fight the infodemic in, in Serbia as a beginning. Um, we, we have uh, started uh, doing webinars, uh, conferences, uh, appearing on TV. Our first, um, let's say, allies were actually the journalists, which was very interesting because the government was not interested in what we have to say, but, uh, but journalists were interested in the, in the topic. Uh, and uh, we we managed to 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 be let's say the hosts of uh, the the global curriculum for infodemic management uh, meeting in in Belgrade, and this was all of that was really a great experience and kind of shaped our our approach to to vaccine acceptance. Uh, on the other hand, um, I am the, the regional team lead for the Momentum Routine Immunization Transformation and Equity Project. Uh, it's running in a lot of countries, but um, uh, we are a group for, for the E&D region, so uh, Eastern Europe or Europe and Eurasia, depends how you, how you want to, to read into that, uh, covering Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Macedonia, Moldova and Serbia. And the idea of the project is to increase the demand for vaccination in priority populations, correct misinformation and disinformation, uh, and uh, foster opportunities for, for learning within country and across the countries, and hopefully wider in the region. Um, some, some specificities about Serbia. Uh, the Momentum Project, again, uh, is working on, on mitigating vaccine hesitancy, encouraging vaccine acceptance. Strengthening capacity of health providers, and I've heard a lot of bad things said about uh, communication and health providers. So I'm a I'm a medical doctor. You can you will understand by the way I communicate, uh, and especially in Eastern <laughs> Europe. So you can you will see this this connection. A medical doctor in Eastern Europe is like you know times a hundred with low communication, low. Why should I explain anything to you? You you come to me and I help you if I can and st stuff like that. And one of our uh, aims was to convene this scientific advisory group and collaborate with other groups to strengthen communication about COVID-19 vaccination. So we found some cute medical doctors who know how to communicate better than, than, than the regular doctors. So what, what, what are some of the challenges in the region? Uh, we can talk about structural, social and internal challenges, definitely a low data and, and uh, fragmented data systems, not enough to, to support decision making. Um, it's difficult from populations in, in uh, uh, remote areas uh, to, to arrive and, and, and get vaccinations. A lot of, high, a lot of uh, misinformation a lot of that misinformation coming from healthcare workers, uh, especially for those with comorbidities uh, and, and thinking the side effects of vaccines are worse than the virus, low level of uh, trust in media and journalists, but also low level of exposure to media and journalists. So it's, it's really difficult to, to see what's what in, in that. Uh, again, a lot, uh, a lot of trust among family and friends. Um, but a lack of, of knowledge about COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccine, uh, exposure to Russian uh, language information and entertainment, depending, of course, on the country, this level varies. Uh, 
And again, fear of side effects. Um, side effects could be worse than the virus. Uh, fear that the vaccine has not been fully tested uh, and how it was developed so quickly. So, yeah, a lot of questions, a lot of problems. Uh, you can add to that not a lot of will from the government to, to work actively on this. So it, it has been yeah, fun to work on this, these projects. Um, uh, as far as behavioral insights, uh, I have learned 20 years ago from our late prime minister, who was actually killed for trying to bring change in Serbia, that you should round, you know, surround yourself with clever people who are smarter than, smarter than you. So you learn from them and you let them do a really good job. So I have, I have done that. So I have a lot of people which, with which I work with who are so much smarter than me and, and I just let them do their thing. And they cover public health, social scientists, ethics, behavioral scientists, and, and statistics. And I have heard, you know, a lot of the speakers here mention uh, trust uh, a lot here. So here are some studies that we have done uh, on, on the societal trust and, and why it's important for vaccine acceptance. And um, the first one, it's something we have done in Western Balkan countries uh, across five countries. And what we have seen is, especially in Serbia, uh, that, that the trust uh, or societal trust increases the likelihood of getting vaccinated by five, five times. So this, is, this was really a huge thing. And then the interpretation of this was, yeah, but it means you know, people don't trust, so they don't want to get vaccinated. But and on a positive note, when, when they trust their healthcare provider and, and the society around them, it means that they are very likely to, to get vaccinated. Um, yeah, we also worked through this EuroHelp group. Uh, we we work with uh, with UNICEF on behavioral insight studies. Again, covering our part of the world: so Montenegro, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Moldova, and and Kosovo. So, uh, what is the tool that we use to to inform our um, uh, our approach? We use behavioral integration. Um, it, it, it focuses on what people must do to, to overcome obstacles to a behavior. Uh, we tried through different studies to identify which are the factors that, that affect this behavior and then design and adapt interventions in a way that, that uh, we, it, they are clearly linked to the behavior that, that we want to have. Um, how did we do that? Well, we, we did it in a few phases. The first phase was formative research using quantitative data, um, uh, some of which was collected because we had some, some holes in our data and some of which was used from, from previous surveys done in, in the countries where we implement. Qualitative data, working with stakeholders, uh, key informants and organizations. Then we created the behavior profiles using uh, this tool that I will demonstrate a little bit uh, later and proposed strategies and then, of course, validated uh, our approach. So. Um, here's the, the, some information about what stakeholders think. Um, always the priority populations were a moving target. So we would start with, you know, the lowest vaccine coverage is among the youth. But then, well, we don't really care because they usually end up being okay. So maybe that's not a priority for our stakeholders. Uh, then the priority are the elderly, but then the vaccination rates are higher at the, uh, with the elderly, so maybe we, we don't care so much because the vaccination rates are, are higher, but somehow we settle to what could be the, the priorities. Uh, then there are a lot of strategies already tried, and it was really a pleasure looking at other strategies tried, so some economic incentives, discounts, uh, blocking the access to the malls, really, really good incentive. Uh, but with various success and uh, nothing was done in a way that you can have or gather data and see how effective they were. Um, different communication approaches from online media, websites, um, but a lot of them done as very short campaigns and one-off solutions, again, with information not updated regularly, so difficult to, to use for, for any decision-making. Uh, and then uh, any decisions are made at the central level. So again, difficult to get the data, difficult to understand if, if this approach has uh, gained any success or not. So from our qualitative research, what we understood in the region is that COVID-19 is just one of many priorities and some of the priorities have jumped over COVID-19 as, as the pandemic was entering 2020, especially 2023. 
priority populations are seen as the same uh, as those for flu vaccines, so elderly, people with chronic diseases, pregnant women, and it was important to align our strategy with general immunization strategies. Uh, patients listened to their healthcare provider advice, but they were not getting this advice from their healthcare providers, either because they don't know how to communicate or they were themselves not sure if they should recommend this to the patients. Um, patients, a lot of the patients wrongly believe that they're not eligible due to aller allergies or chronic health conditions, or someone told them that they're not el eligible due to that, those problems. Uh, uh, there is a really, really poor information environment, a lack of, of quality and reliable health information, which is provided by patients um, about COVID-19 and vaccination. And then the healthcare providers also don't feel like they have all the information necessary, that they have the adequate uh, training, uh, resources, etc. From the quantitative research, uh, we understood that, of course, the, the vaccine acceptance was significantly lower among pregnant women and people with chronic diseases. Uh, people with chronic diseases are very likely to believe that vaccines are unsafe for them in their condition, um, and, and they don't trust their healthcare provider, or they don't trust that their healthcare provider has all the information necessary to understand their condition and the interaction with the vaccination. Similar situation is with the pregnant women. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it was, we understood that it was necessary to, to support both the patients and the healthcare providers if we are going to, to make a difference in this um, problem. So here on the top, you have the QR codes that lead you to the interactive uh, behavior profiles that we created. And I will just go through one of them here, but it's really better if you open it uh, on your phone or your, on your computer, because you can also see the pathways to change. Um, the priority behaviors that we identified uh, that could work also for our stakeholders is that patients with chronic diseases, pregnant women, healthcare workers get vaccinated, but we also focused on the behavior of healthcare workers where we wanted them to recommend the COVID-19 vaccine uh, and also for the specialists to recommend the COVID-19 vaccine. So here, maybe we underline the importance of integration of, of vaccination into other services where, where it's possible. The supporting actors, institutes of public health, Ministry of Health, pharmaceutical regulatory agencies, professional chambers, health professionals, those are all the actors that can help us achieve our, our behavior and that help the, the, the persons achieve the behavior that we want. And again, some critical factors and time for counseling was the first one. We don't have time to do this. Uh, so let's take a look at one of the behavior profiles. So as you can see, it has several elements, behaviors and steps necessary to perform the behavior factors, which could be barriers and motivators, supporting actors and program strategies. So if, if we look at, at this, we can see that, you know, the steps, uh, the behavior is that as part of a healthy lifestyle. So that's another thing that we did. We tried to reframe immunization as part of taking care of your health as something positive, as also mentioned by some of the previous speakers. So as part of a healthy lifestyle, uh, where we had also uh, healthy diet, being physically active, reducing stress, sleeping well, etc., which also aligns with WHO identified priorities for Eastern Europe, Serbia, and our countries, uh, and also priorities from the government. So it was difficult for someone to say, well, we don't want to work on this because it's not important for us. It is important for us, but as part of the healthy lifestyle, also, this is a profile for pregnant women, pregnant women should get a uh, full course of COVID-19 vaccine. And of course, there are some steps that they need. So they probably need to find information and you see the information is the first, how to stay healthy and, and what's important for them in their condition. Find information about you know, COVID-19 vaccination and how it helps their baby. Discuss the, the practice with, uh, with their partner or the father. Uh, find out where to get vaccinated and then discuss this with the healthcare provider. Uh, and, and also it spreads to other people in, in their vicinity. So which were, which were the factors? Um, of course, uh, there was a problem because the vaccine was not recommended by their health provider. Uh, uh, the family might not support and other factors that were identified here. So the family might not support that getting vaccinated while pregnant is good for the woman and the baby, etc. cetera. Um, and then also, which could be the supporting actors uh, and actions. So maybe medical specialists, 
following the guidelines that exist about recommending vaccinations uh, or advising uh, their patients to get vaccinated, etc. And finally, when, you, when we look at the program strategies uh, in different areas like the enabling environment, system products and services, what could we do to, to, make, to, to arrive to the, this change? How did we do the validation? Well, we worked with, um, okay, I have enough time, that's good. How did we do with the validation? We worked with our key stakeholders when we proposed this strategy and we included them in, in every step uh, to reduce the, the, the possibility of uh, pushback, uh, to see that the priorities align, that, that they agree with, with you know, how we could go around uh, doing our work. And then um, as one of the, the problems that was identified is the healthcare providers, they don't want to listen anymore about COVID-19, but they do need continuing uh, medical education courses so they could renew their license. So we accredited our program as a continuing medical education course uh, on healthy lifestyles, immunization, including COVID-19 vaccination and quality health service. And that was the quality health service was uh, trying to address two parts of the, of the barriers. One of them was, we don't have time for this, so we were trying to show them that they actually do have time if they use it wisely. And on the other hand, um, to, to increase the satisfaction of both patients and the medical doctors so that they would feel they're doing something important and they would, they would get the positive feedback contrary to the, all the negative feedback they were getting whenever they were about to talk about uh, immunization for which they were not ready. Um, we also also developed a community or collective engagement approach with uh, community-based organizations and civil society organizations. And we, I will show you now, uh, to implement this, we have spread our activities through the network of institutes of public health in, in all the districts of Serbia. So there were two options we had to decide between. One was whether we want to do our activities as a group of uh, specially trained uh, trainers who go around uh, the countries and, and perform or, or deliver this training to medical doctors. The other option which uh, allowed more sustainability was to build capacity at the district level with the local institutes of public health with people who, would, who could then continue doing this training long after any project is over and could also you know, feel empowered to develop this in their own in, in direction they think is necessary for their district. How did we address the infodemic? We also focused on, on the institutes of public uh, health and um, our laboratory, of course, uh, since we, we have really low funding, so it's really difficult, as you know, in the infodemic, when you already have misinformation and disinformation, it's really difficult to change it. But what we have tried to do is, is strengthen the capacity of, of uh, Serbia to, to um, identify opportunities and fill the information gaps, information voids, and address all the possible questions at the right moment so that we don't arrive to misinformation and disinformation, which is much cheaper and, and feasible for us, while the other thing is, is impossible. We also uh, demonstrated what a few uh, infodemic insights reports could uh, look like to our stakeholders, and we have performed the training in, again in the institutes of public health around Serbia and uh, engage them into discussion to recognize what could be the influence of the infodemic, what could be the sources, what could be the communication channels they need to use, etc. So kind of getting them on board with the uh, with, uh, information environment way of, of thinking. As far as the, the uh, collective engagement and continuing medical education, we have developed materials uh, for the medical doctors and for, for the patients so they can be uh, presented uh, and, and delivered through workshops. Uh, focusing on the key messages and addressing the main misinformation, disinformation, but also other barriers that were identified in the formative research and how this information was, was delivered through this training of, of trainings, uh, training of trainers uh, in uh, different districts of uh, Serbia. We have worked with medical doctors uh, who actually are epidemiologists or social medicine specialists or hygiene specialists that usually work with medical doctors in their districts so that they could go on and do, and for now they have done, they have trained around 300 healthcare professionals 
but considering that, for example, in Serbia, one, one primary healthcare doctor or general medicine specialist covers between 1,600 and 3,000 patients, uh, it, it could really have a, a really high impact in, in these small municipalities uh, uh, in, in the END countries. The same thing happened with, uh, with collective engagement with our partners. We have done, so this is 20 minutes. So with, uh, with our partners uh, in the field, they have, they have worked with patients and pregnant women um, on the collective engagement. And what you can see is, for example, they, they created these games where they try to solve a puzzle that at the end shows them all the healthy lifestyles. And um, the, the, the reaction was really positive. Um, just this is, I think, one of the, the last slides. So. Um, how did we engage the public? We formed this scientific advisory group, uh, a group uh, made of uh, immunologists and virologists, and we helped them or we organized for them whenever, whenever there was a need, uh, press conferences which were uh, widely covered by the media. But not only that the press conference was covered, but also the media then knew who they can ask for additional information, for a special statement, or to answer additional questions. Even in the time where we didn't organize any press conferences, it is these people that became the source of, of uh, accurate and correct information for the public and for the medical doctors, because they are from the Faculty of Medicine, so for the medical doctors and for the public about uh, COVID-19 vaccination and general immunization. So here are my conclusions. Um, we used our data creatively and uh, wherever data was available, we used the available data. When we needed some additional uh, data, we collected new data, uh, but only to identify barriers, motivators and supporting actors and their actions so we could build a behavior profile. Um, this is uh, the Think Big platform that created the behavior profile. It's a decision support tool. It's an approach, a, a framework, call it whatever you want, that can help really put all the different uh, uh, barriers and motivators in a nice way to, to show the through the theory of change what do we expect to happen, but also to prioritize because we cannot address 150 barriers and motivators. We can probably focus on the most significant ones. Uh, we validated our strategy with our stakeholders to get their support so we could really implement it. And then we also worked on, on addressing the needs of our healthcare providers. So they have so many other things on their mind that immunization is just one of them. And we try to, to frame also for them this training as something that will help them do their job better, be more satisfied, make their patients more satisfied, but also help the society. Let's see. So what are the next steps? Um, we are working as the um, infodemic management lab to develop an infodemic management curriculum for medical and pharmacy students. Uh, we want to accredit an infodemic management curriculum for medical doctors in Serbia and in the region. Um, and we are hoping to advance uh, the, the use of behavioral and cultural insights uh, in, in Serbia because we, we have gained some experience and, and expertise in this field and definitely they're not being used in, in the END countries. Uh, of course, uh, trying to, to get more funding for, for immunization and help by, by the funding agencies. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>